It is not my goal to be a restorationist. I want to be a Christian. Today I'm sitting down with Dr. Rubel Shelley, who is an author, debater, college educator, and administrator, but most importantly, you are a child of God. For that's, my, that's my only claim to fame. Claim to fame. That's the big one. Uh, for the sake of conversation, you don't mind that I just call you Rubel, do you? Oh, please do. Okay. I'm not surprised by that. I'm going to call you Brother Robinson. Okay. You just call me Caleb, <laughs> Oh, too. okay. Just call me Caleb. Uh, one of the things that I noticed, and I didn't think that you would mind, are you aware that only one of, and you've written over 20 books, easily, do you know that only one of them says doctor on the cover? Mm, I don't carry that title around. Right. That's an academic title that I'm have to use in some settings, especially when you're a school administrator. But um, if you're fortunate enough to be able to spend some time in school, you do it for the value of what you can learn. And for me, I always tell students, you, you will never learn as much as you need to know, but you'll learn some methodology and tools that you can use for the rest of your life. So, yeah, I'm grateful that I've had a chance to go to school, but I I don't wave that flag a lot. Well, I thought it was very interesting about you because surely you'd have some say, make sure you put doctor in there, but only one of them had that on there. <laughs> uh, but what I really wanted to, I visited with you in December. We made arrangements for this. And the way I wanted to engage this conversation with you, I am a decade into local work and brotherhood politics. <laughs> and I am coming to the conclusion that for people my age, and I would probably say as you were back in the 80s, the brotherhood politics, I would say, is the biggest thing that's squashing young men out mm -hmm. of doing, if you want to call it kingdom work, ministry work, I think that you have noted, I would say, as thoroughly as anybody else, and that's what I'd like to talk to you today about. It's um, your interview, and we'll go the direction you want to go. Okay. okay. And, and I've been in ministry just over 60 years. And I would say what you're calling brotherhood politics is, I think, the right word for what I've sometimes called institutional church as opposed to kingdom mission. And you have to decide early on, are your goals built around pleasing God or pleasing men. So that's kingdom or institutional or it's faithful to the mission of the church or playing brotherhood politics. Um, you have to get that clear early on or you can't stay in ministry. Right. Well, what I wanted to start with, your book, I Just Want to Be a Christian, will actually turn 40 next year. That's right. And I wanted to read a quote from page four. Uh, and this, I think, is absolutely it. The spiritual vision of the founders is dimmed by the routines of institutional life. What began as a movement has become a bureaucratic organization. And I think that young men are drowning in the bureaucratic organization of it all. But as I quote this book, and I, you know, I know it's going to have its 40th anniversary next year. I've read that more than once. And there are young guys... They're going to see this, and they will have been told not to even look at this. And the reason I wanted to talk with you, this was in 1984. There is so much about you that young men are not being told, and I think that it's being kept from them on purpose. I attended the Memphis School of Preaching. I left there, attended another school of preaching called the Tri-City School of Preaching. And I don't know if you remember this. Do you remember that you gave me three reasons why you actually might not want to do this interview? I could have given you a longer <laughs> list. <laughs> One, you don't like being on camera. Two, you said, I think people have forgotten who I am. And three, you said, those who have not forgotten me don't want to hear from me. And my response was, you are certainly not forgotten. You are the go-to anytime a, quote, conservative needs to kick a, quote, liberal. And through what I have read about you, it is unbelievable 
that that just gets to be the attitude. So my first question that introduces people to you, do you know that you were in conversation to be the replacement editor of Gospel Advocate after BC Good Pasture? Not really. Uh, I think some rumor of that sort of bounced back to me and I, I dismissed it out of hand. I was never interviewed or talked to about doing that. Um, let, let me let me react to two or three things just okay. in setting that up. First, the, the quote from the book. Interestingly, um, I read a piece from Stan Hauerwas um, within the last, I don't know, three to five years. And he said the same thing about the Methodist Church, <laughs> which I think is his primary background, that I said here. He said, Methodism set out to be a movement. And of course... Uh, with the Wesleys, the methodology of going deep into scripture and worship and so on. It was it was not an attempt at the beginning, in all likelihood, to start a new denomination. It was to enhance spiritual depth and commitment on the part of people who were already believers by some methods. Today we'd talk about spiritual disciplines, probably. They called them methodologies. And out of that came the Methodist Church. I'm not a church historian. I'm a philosopher and a theologian. But if what little bit I know about Restoration history is correct, I have no idea that Thomas and Alexander Campbell or that Barton Stone or Raccoon John Smith or Come Closer, um, any of the names that we would know, like a, a David Lipscomb or a James Harding, I have no idea that they wanted to found a competitive denomination. In fact, I think the notion of institutionalism would have been as offensive to them as it is to me. And by institutionalism, I mean you set up your own written or unwritten, and unwritten is worse than written. Right. You set up your written or unwritten criteria of who's in or who's out with our movement or our church our paper, our school, our church. And you begin very quickly to take the role that I believe belongs to God alone to decide whose name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I, I do believe that what we call the American Restoration Movement or the Stone Campbell Movement was early on a movement, broad-based movement, Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists, that didn't set out to start a new church, but sort of like the Wesley, the Wesley is what became Methodism, to to deepen faith and and to make faith real. Restoration to me is the recapturing of this fresh move of the Spirit of God that they experienced, and the mission of taking the message of Jesus out into the world. But we institutionalized them, and so over a period of time, especially post Constantine. Christianity became what, looking back, we now call the Roman Catholic Church after the Protestant Reformation. Protestant Reformation, now we have Lutherans, and we have Presbyterians, now we have Methodists, and we have Baptists. I don't think Campbell, Stone, and others said, there's not a denomination we're comfortable in. We want to start a new one. They wanted to do what um, maybe Paul wanted to do at Corinth called some people who morally and doctrinally were confused back to the focus on Christ. And Campbell and Stone in their centuries said, we, we need to call people back to the heart of Jesus. Frankly, I think, Caleb, for you and your generation, anybody from your generation who's listening to us, that's your task wherever you are. It's not to preserve the institution that is the Church of Christ or the non-institutional Church of Christ or the international Church of Christ or the subset of Church of Christ that's premillennial. The, the goal is always to recapture the vision that the earliest church had of allowing the Holy Spirit to work, uh, to see that the gospel is proclaimed and that lives are given the opportunity of transformation of the Spirit's power as they respond to the gospel in an obedient, disciplined, humble faith. 
So that, that's a long rambling yeah. answer to that quote. But yeah, I'm still where that quote was. I, I am not a representative of the institutional church of any brand or denomination. I'm more non-denominational today, I think, than I have ever been in my life. You can't brand Jesus to a t-shirt, a trinket, or to a church sign. Uh, Jesus is going to show up in places that people don't expect him. And I'm probably going to bump into people when I'm with the Lord in eternity. I didn't expect to bump into. Uh, but that's the Lord's doing and right. the Lord's business. My task is to preach the gospel as I understand that message. It focuses on Jesus, calls people to an obedient faith in him. And nobody's obedience is perfect. Mine certainly is. As we understand and grow, as we change our minds, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse, uh, we, we pray for God to work within us to purify our understanding, purify our faith, and certainly to purify our obedience, our lifestyle of trying to imitate Jesus. Well, I think uh, it's hard to do that, all that you just said when uh, about convincing people to leave their traditional uh, institution just to simply pick up mine, yeah. which would have its papers and its colleges and yeah. its heroes. Uh, and I think that that's a big problem that uh, people my age, and obviously it's what you all were battling in the 80s. Yeah. That idea of I want to talk to people about the New Testament and Jesus of Nazareth as a Christ without having to then bring in mm -hmm. all this extra baggage. Do you think that in the late 70s, were you already on that way of thinking? Like you said, you heard rumors about your potential being the replacement editor and gospel advocate. Would you have already been moving away from, you know, if you're, that's one of the two biggest papers for traditional Church of Christ folk, if I can say it that way, gospel advocate, firm foundation. Uh, it's pretty hard to not have this appearance of a denomination when everybody's getting their information from one of two sources. Yep. Uh, in my friends who are church historians and restoration historians um, attribute to papers and their editors and to schools and their presidents or, or primary administrators uh, a lot of influence. Um, the Firm Foundation, the other side of the Mississippi, uh, the Gospel Advocate, this side of the Mississippi had lots of influence. And then when you get into colleges, you, you you talk certainly about Harding or Abilene or Fried Hardeman and then later other schools. You see them all casting a shadow. I think those days are largely past. Um, I I don't think we have uh, and I, I stand either to be embarrassed here or to maybe offend somebody. You don't mean to offend. I don't even know that the Gospel Advocate or the Firm Foundation is still being published. Do you? I don't think Firm Foundation is. Gospel Advocate is, if it's still going, it's very minuscule. Okay. Well, that that, might, that makes my point. Right. Uh, if they are being published, I haven't seen them. And it's not that I've tried to avoid them. I'm into a lot of homes. This is a church library. I haven't seen those. Papers don't have that kind of influence anymore. Colleges don't even have that kind of influence anymore. Colleges, some, because they, they train preachers. Or there are not many people trained right. to preach these days, so um, I, I don't I don't know where the primary points of influence are that would parallel papers and colleges a hundred or even fifty years ago. I don't think they're there. Right. Um, large churches in areas um, cast a long shadow. Um, what what they do will influence what smaller churches and and the edges of the town or in the state or the region may do. Um, I, I think that's healthier. Um, we, we are more institutional if we say, well, what does my paper say I should believe about that? Or what does my school say right. about that? Or for that matter, what are they saying over at Skunk Hollow Church, which is you know where I grew up or where, where I think the big preacher in my region is holding forth Sunday to Sunday. Uh, maybe it's the internet. Um, maybe it's maybe it's just the notion of um, radical independence that is pretty widespread in America historically. To say, eh, I'm not going to let anybody tell me what to believe. I'm I'm going to try to think it through. I 
I, I have a Bible. Um, I, I can read and um, I can go to the internet and, and get information there. Uh, I can get as much information as is around us in this mm -hmm. library right now just by going online and, and connecting. A lot of these books are online in PDF form and they're out of copyright date. Right. Well, I think uh, with that idea and obviously the things that you have said thus far, as I was saying earlier, young guys are usually steered away from your material. And I think that if they had an, a knowledge of, like you said, your background, was that real skunk hollow? <laughs> no, that, that, that's, my, that, <laughs> that's just a joke. That, that's, when I talk about politics, <laughs> I talk about Republicans and Republicans okay. so that I don't needlessly uh, offend you. Right. Skunk hollow church okay. is just, just my well, paradigm church. That, yeah. uh, but for them to know these things, because they think that you're just, I've used that word, you were villainized. And so mm. this idea that you were up, and did you know who actually was promoting you for a replacement editor? No. It was Ira Rice. Get out of town. It was Ira You're telling me stuff that yeah. I have never known. <laughs> Ira Rice, you were, uh, at that little bit of an insult he put in there, he said, I had five choices and Rubel Shelley was my sixth. But you were in there. Mm. And I think that's a big that. deal. Uh, well, let, let me respond to that. <laughs> okay. I, I've never thought I was important. I, I've never thought I was trying to be the voice for either this institution or this movement. I, I preached for one little church in Midtown Nashville, Tennessee, for 27 years. And sermons went out on audio cassette tapes. Um, sometimes sermon manuscripts went out. I, I've never tried to be the Brotherhood thought person or the Brotherhood spokesperson. Um, I am one bumbling Christian trying to figure it out for himself as I go. And because I'm a teacher, uh, a lot of the things I try to figure out, I wind up trying to figure out in public. Um, sometimes in public, I just have to, when presented with a question, say, I don't know. And I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to think that one through, or I've never thought about that. But let me have some time to think about it. Um, there have been topics, uh, when I, w I was preaching for that church where I was for uh, 27 years, for three years, I refused to teach on a given subject because when people would ask me, I'd say, I don't know. I was taught one thing. I'm just convinced that that's not right anymore. It doesn't fit. But I'm not sure what I believe. Uh, I, I've got to have more time. I spent three years, um, not, not every day, but I spent three years devoting as much time as I could to the subject of divorce and remarriage because I, I was taught up, uh, I was brought up and taught uh, all the answers to that you can write on a three by five card. I, I live a while and I deal with real people and I study scripture and I realize it, 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 it takes packages of index cards to, to raise the complexities that are part of this question. And to think that I can give a glib, neat answer um, to those questions um, is dishonest. Paul struggles uh, with giving people answers to that in 1 Corinthians 7. And he said this and that. And, you know, Jesus said this, and I feel safe quoting that. He said, now, on this one, I don't have anything that I can quote from Jesus on that. So I'm going to have to give you my judgment as somebody that uh, I believe is trustworthy because I, Paul had a sense, I'm convinced, that he was guided by the Spirit in a way that I don't uh, have direct revelation. So if, if Paul can wrestle with that, and if Peter can say, our beloved brother Paul writes some things in his letters that are hard to understand, I'm, I'm no longer embarrassed to say, boy, that's a tough question. Um, you and I are sitting at a table where just a few minutes ago I, I plopped down the manuscript of a book that I've just written on same-sex union, same-sex marriage. I don't have all the answers about that. Now, I know what Scripture says about that. But I also know people have been very mean and unkind to people who are gay or lesbian or who are struggling with their sexual identity. And this culture can confuse people uh, without their intending to be evil. And some of the things that I've heard Christians say, conservative Christians like me say to people who are involved in the homosexual lifestyle have been mean. Not just straightforward and true, that's one thing. 
but they they've just been mean spirited, and I suspect they've caused some people to go deeper into uh, some non-Christian beliefs and attitudes by saying, "Well, if that's what I have to be to be a Christian, I want no part of it," and they can be accepted in a gay community. I, I believe that same-sex intercourse in whatever form is sinful. I, I think you have to misread scripture voraciously to come up with a conclusion other than that, but I don't think you have to be hateful to people who are wrestling through a traumatic divorce, who are confused in this culture about their sexual identity or their sexual behaviors, or people more nearly in this culture who are prone to be greedy, or let's just face it, uh, in the last five years, the big pushback that I've received to what I've preached is if I say something about racism. Uh, I'm Southerner, and most of the work that I do, I do in the South. And uh, when I deal with some of the statements from Jesus and his relationship to Samaritans, or statements from Paul about Jews and Gentiles, and begin to make application of that or attempt in, in a church to implement um, that we're one in Christ, I've gotten some really nasty emails. And I've gotten some tough in your face stuff. And you would say that was lately? Uh, oh, within the last three to five years, right. that has been the hot issue but that's... That, that people have been in my face about because I've said not as much probably as I should about it. And it's, you say that's to this day, let's say 2020 and following, but that is actually how you lost your first preaching job, isn't it? <laughs> well, you know the story, don't you? Yeah. Um, Dr. King was assassinated in April of 1968, I guess it was. And that was on a Thursday, as I recall. And I was preaching for a church in Mississippi about 80 miles out of Memphis. And so on Sunday morning, I preached on the attitude of a Christian in the midst of a race crisis. And I drew from some Old Testament material, from some New Testament material, to say, looking back, some things that were pretty bland, that the hatred between races, whether it's white, toward black or white and black toward Native American or whatever the, the racist attitude may be. It, it's just an outworking of the old Jew-Gentile problem. And it, it's, it's not a new problem for the church, but we still haven't solved it. And the fact that in 1968, cities were burning, uh, that there had been a murder, and now there was the reaction in the streets. That was Sunday morning, and um, I was fired on Monday night for having preached that sermon. Well, not for just having preached the sermon. I was fired because I wouldn't recant uh, and retract you know, what I'd said that day, that as a church, we could not uh, exclude African-American people from our assemblies. Uh, as a church, we could not observe the unspoken line that that church had at a, literally at a railroad track, that children were not invited to VBS on the other side of that track right. because that was the black part of town. I said, I'll, I'll never observe that any longer. And I was given the option of um, repenting and apologizing or losing my job. I wasn't trying to create trouble, but it was just a matter of integrity. Yeah. How can you say that you represent a Jewish savior as a Gentile proclaimer? and then say, but I can only proclaim to people who are racially, ethnically, and increasingly even um, conservative Protestant Christianity, Church of Christ, American Restoration Movement. You can't do that and follow the Christ of the Gospels. So I, I guess that they had that problem in the book of Acts and had to have a conference in Acts 15 mm -hmm. and, and debate it. Uh, the fact that it was going on in 1968 and the fact that um, it's still a hot issue in this culture means we still have work to do. Right. And I think that in every place of the world, my parents did uh, Pacific mission work. And out there, uh, you would have 
Fijians and mm -hmm. Indians, and yeah. both of them have brown skin, but they dislike each other. So I think it's everywhere. It is. Uh, oh, it, it's not a peculiarly American phenomenon. It, it's in the Book of Acts. Uh, um, and of course, today, the presence of so many uh, Hispanic people uh, doing jobs that most white people are not willing to mm -hmm. have, and yet complaining that they're taking our jobs away by being here. The, the, the roots go deep, and politicians play on it. They beat it like a drum. And then, and then churches and preachers and religious papers and movements align with the politicians. They have a little bit of the eye of power. So, yeah, it, it's a complex set of problems. And if you want to trace it back, Caleb, you know, Genesis 3 is just the beginning of a lot of problems. Right. Um, Adam, Eve, you got two choices. You can live with me and, and live. Or you can decide that you can run this thing your way. And you're going to run into problem after problem. Well, they ate the fruit. And we're still reaping the consequences. Absolutely, we are still reaping the consequences. And that from 68 till now. Uh, one thing that I want to ask your take on in that story. That's your first preaching job. And you are offered this chance to apologize or to mm -hmm. repent somehow of that. So there were t one thing that you were basically saying was, as a young man, uh, and I don't know at that point how old you might have been uh, in 69, but you're saying in one way, well, that's what happens when you preach your conscience. But my real question about that scenario is, when I hear that, I have to ask, do you think that there is an unhealthy relationship between local elders and schools of preaching and Bible colleges? Because what I mean by that is, well, Rubel said something on Sunday we don't like. So we're going to get rid of him, and we'll ask them to send us a new man. And it's just you and the young people to follow are always that movable piece. Yeah, could be. Um, I was early, mid-20s at that point, 24, 25 years old. I, I would correct the way you said it. I wasn't preaching my conscience. Okay. Um, I, I was preaching my best understanding of Scripture because I, I was reared in an environment where, I mean, I went to a segregated public school and I went to a segregated Christian college. I think my conscience would have been comfortable to this day just being a white guy going to white places right. with white people. I, I don't think my conscience one day woke up and said, wait a minute, here's somebody who's African-American and, well, back when I was very young, they don't have the same voting rights you do. They can't, they can't eat in the same place you do. I grew up in a small West Tennessee town. White people ate in the front. Black people could be served out the back window of that little, one little cafe. My conscience didn't bother me when I was 14. Or 16. I, I don't think you know, I could graduate high school and leave it. I don't think it occurred to me that what I was born to needed to change. And, and I think that's fairly normal. Mm -hmm. What I know must be right. I mean, I was born to it. Uh, th this is the way we do it at our church. This is the way we do it at our school. This is the way we do it at the cafe. This is the way we do it, whatever. Um, I was reading the Bible, though. And you know something's wrong, number one, when there's a murder. Well, somebody, and I think they caught James Earl Ray fairly soon, that somebody killed a man in Memphis, Tennessee. Well, he was down there causing trouble. Uh, well, he didn't start the trouble. Uh, the trouble was a group of people were being mistreated, and he went there to rally them. And Okay, but... Whoever did what for whatever reason, murder's wrong. And now then to hear um, black people being called the most horrible names, some of which I'd used in high school. Um, but my conscience had begun to bother me because I was reading scripture. And during that time, civil rights movement is getting off the ground. And yet I, I, I know that's what made me begin to read scripture to say, well, what's right about this? Well, I knew that was wrong, so I 
I spoke to that. It happened on Thursday. I spoke to it on Sunday. I, I have this problem. I tend to think, <laughs> yeah. this is a Carl Bart thing, I think. Uh, you, you need to read the Bible and, and newspaper and, you know, equal hands, and you need to say, this is not the report of the culture. This is not normative. This is. How does this overlay the news of the day? How does it put it in perspective? And that's all I was trying to do that Sunday. I wasn't trying to cause trouble in that church. Right. Oh, it did cause trouble. Got me fired. Um, I don't regret it. I, I don't regret preaching the sermon. This, what I said in the sermon, it, it wasn't really enough. But, but it was true mm -hmm. that racism is, is sinful and we have to do something about black and white. And we have to do something about races and their being able to find oneness in Christ. So I don't apologize for the sermon. I don't apologize for not repenting, recanting, and apologizing for, for having preached. I couldn't do that. And, and frankly, it, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Because um, if on that day, in order to keep a job, I had been quiet about what I believed to be true, um, surely I'd have had to have gone into farming or manufacturing or something. I, I couldn't be a preacher of the gospel. Because to preach the gospel, you, you have to navigate by the polar star of Jesus. And Jesus welcomed Samaritans. Jesus welcomed women. Jesus valued children. And in the Greco-Roman world, Samaritans were dogs to Jews. Women had no rights or place. Children, children were disposable. Infanticide was not unusual. Jesus is teaching us that the image of God is more precious in human beings than we sometimes allow it to be. And that's, that's at the center of the gospel message, that because we're in the image and likeness of God, every person, child, female, divorced person, alcoholic, gay person, God loves them because his image is imprinted on them. Now, they may have defaced and marred that image by sin. We all have. But the message of the gospel is not, get out of here, you scum. The message of the gospel is, come closer to Jesus and let him help you and transform you and make you into the likeness of, of another child in the, who's welcome in the Father's house. Well, one way that you said that, uh, absolutely, and the fact that I, hearing it is fascinating to me that you would say that there was a literal geographic marker being on the train tracks, but yeah. where we are now and from that time then, one of the things that you said was, it was one of the best things that ever happened to you, and the surprise to this story, as you would say, for a lot of people, they would say it was one of the greatest events too for them and everybody else because after 68 uh, and 69 is when you, this would be the surprise to people, were in heavily involved in recreating Spiritual Sword magazine mm -hmm. with Thomas Warren. Yeah, I, I, and I didn't realize it was recreating. Um, I was beginning to get interested at that point in my life in Christian apologetics. We were very, very, very secular world and secular age, and more so than in the 60s. Uh, materialism, physicalism are, are the default to our culture. Um, God is an ancient superstition. Jesus, eh, must have been a neat guy, but, you know, God in the flesh, God incarnate, no, no, no. I believe those truths. I believe there's a personal God who became incarnate in Jesus. I believe that he performed miracles. I believe that he taught what we needed to know and empowered the apostles through the Spirit to carry that process through. I believe I believe this is the, the Word of God to us that, that's relevant for all time and place. And so I was beginning to develop a real interest in trying to communicate to my culture, and that meant apologetics the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the, the authority of Scripture. And the person that I respected most, uh, who was saying the most about it and that made sense to me and I thought was the smartest guy that I knew saying anything about it, uh, was Thomas Warren. And um, I was working with this church in Memphis and sort of sold him on the idea of, of 
some sort of publication. Would it be four pages? Would it be 20 pages? We didn't know, but some sort of publication to address the secular world and to talk about the existence of God, to talk about the inspiration of Scripture and the authority of Scripture. And they approved it in principle, started talking about how they could fund it. And I said, but I couldn't edit it. We need somebody who, who knows this field and who's working in it. Oh, well, did I know Dr. Warren? Could I approach him? Well, a little bit, and, and I did only a little bit. So I approached him, he was interested, and the Spiritual Sword was founded to be an apologetics journal. And it, that, that, was, that was the understanding between um, Dr. Warren and me and with the elders of that church, that it would not become a, quote, brotherhood paper. It would focus on issue after issue. The original idea was probably four issues a year. It would focus on apologetics, and it would be useful across the board to people, churches of Christ, but to people from whatever background, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, who, would, who were willing to take a stand that, that Scripture is the Word of God, um, spiritual realities are the ultimate and true realities. And I, I, I hadn't been aware there'd been a paper called The Spiritual Sword before. Brother Warren said, you know, I used to publish a paper that said, I really like that title. I, I forget others that we've talked about. I said, I, don't, I didn't particularly like the sword idea, the sort of fighting idea, but the more we talked about it, yeah, we're fighting for faith. It was called The Spiritual Sword. And the first two, three issues really were about issues and apologetics. And um, I, uh, I was never the editor. I, I just sort of did the, the grunt work on it. You were co-editor. I was, I was the co-editor. But I, I'm, I'm just saying the, the invitations to articles and who would write for okay. it and lay it out. Um, I knew what was being sent out, but it wasn't mine to determine. Increasingly, it, it began to focus on brotherhood issues, and that's that's when I both left that church and and the paper. Uh, again, I don't know if it's still being published or not, or how long it was published. But I'm I, I hope the paper did some good. Um, but um, <laughs> Thomas Warren is one of the people that I will always be grateful to. Um, uh, he was a good man. Uh, w later on, we we disagreed about some things, but hey. I, I disagree with most everybody I know about something, and they me, so that's no big deal. Um, loved him and appreciated him. Um, he helped me get into uh, the program uh, at, at Vanderbilt that I went to, um, similar to the program that he had done there. Couldn't have gotten in without him, I'm sure. I'll always be indebted to him. Uh, his, his, he has two children who are still living. Uh, I had the opportunity to be with him when he had some health problems uh, later, um, and he was hospitalized here in Nashville. Uh, good to reconnect with him and his wife, Faye. Uh, of course, they're both dead now, but his, his two daughters, uh, Jan and Karen, um, I hadn't seen either of them in a while, but I think highly of them. Knew their son, Lindsay. He, he died uh, very young, uh, heart condition. So, yeah. I was I was there, helped get that off the ground. It was meant to be an apologetics paper. It, it took a little different turn, but um, hope it did some hope it did some good. Well, I think there would be people right now who would say, "Oh, it did loads of good, and we loved it." They put it together in hardbacks. I don't know if you knew that, so mm -hmm. you could get all of them in these very nice red no, I didn't know that. hardbacks. But the way that books go is they don't always read the books they buy. And so I had a friend of mine, he said something about Spiritual Sword, and I said, yeah, look at volume one, number one. And I said, now tell me who the co-editor is. And he said, I had no idea that Rebel mm. Shelley was involved with this. And you were? Yeah. Uh, three years, you stayed with it for three years. And then mm -hmm. uh, you were, were you taught by Warren at Harding Graduate? Yes. I, I just took every course that he taught that I could get into. I loved him, uh, respected him, always will. So that's the, the other side of that is young guys have no idea that you had that. And I, that's very close connection to Thomas Warren. I don't. Oh, he was a mentor. Um, we became close friends. Yeah. So that uh, there are some other points in here that I, I'd like to go backwards if we could. 
in order to start moving forward. Sure. So you you did not know that Ira was uh, promoting you as one of his choices for gospel advocate. I did not. So <laughs> did you happen to hear, and I'll have some other quotes here to go along with what we just said about spiritual sword. Did you hear what VC supposedly said as to why you were not a selection? No, I think this is this is revelation okay, today. Okay, huh? so the, I said earlier we'll have a quote in here that's questionable. Ira promoted you. You were one of his choices, and this is the way that he said it exactly. This is the quote exactly. He said, whomever I was talking to exploded. Oh, no. V.C. Goodpasture says Ruble was unstable. <laughs> and the problem I have with that is that he would put in his paper secondhand news, secondhand quotations. Mm -hmm. He didn't get that from V.C. He quoted someone who was hmm. quoting B.C. Goodpasture. You know, I, I don't think I ever met Brother Goodpasture. Um, I wrote a few articles for the Gospel Advocate, so we corresponded, but um, I, well, I, I'd i never heard that. The, if, if that was ever said, um, it wouldn't be because we'd had contact and okay. he, he'd do anything about me. Well, he died in 1977, and there, from what I can find, is absolutely... And that quote was printed in 84, which mm -hmm. is when everybody was up in arms about you. <laughs> but there really is nothing in the 70s that would point me or anybody else to say, well, Rubel Shelley's showing signs of instability. The, <laughs> the one of two biggest papers, the other one, Firm Foundation, in 1976, you were listed as one of the top three logicians in the Brotherhood. The man writing the article. I, I, I wrote I wrote for both of those papers. Uh, I don't know the dates exactly, but during that period of time. Um, yeah. And they compared you, they said, surely one doesn't have to be a Guy Woods, a Roy Deaver, or a Rubel Shelley to understand the con uh, consequences of this premise. Hmm. And then one more, Doug Foster, he had a small section about you in one of his history books. He said, Rubel Shelley, as a young leader of the conservative wing, was the loudest against liberal preachers and liberal congregations. So as far as those papers go, to say the possibility that he said Ruble was unstable, I see no signs of that in 1970s <laughs> documentation. The fact that you were not only educated at Freed Hardman, you were student body president at Freed Hardman. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. All of this. Yeah, I was class president for two years then student body president. Um, Doug's comment, um, that's probably right. Okay. Uh, that I I I I did attempt to be um, a, a voice against theological liberalism. I still am, uh, but I, I guess you have to define what liberalism right. is. Um, I, I had a fellow once. He was a, a preacher of my era, um, same age. We didn't go to school together, but but we were working in the same area. He came to a meeting I was preaching, and this was back in the seventies. And I, I had on, uh, I was preaching, but I didn't have, don't have one on today. I didn't have on a white shirt. It was, it was sort of a, a, as I remember, sort of a mustard-colored shirt with brown suit. He came up to me afterward. I don't know that he heard anything. He said, every liberal I ever knew wore colored shirts. <laughs> and I thought he was kidding, and I reacted like he did. And he said, I mean it. And stopped laughing, and I said, well, Every liberal I ever knew drove a car with white sidewall tires. White sidewalls were coming back in those. I said, do we need to check your car? And he left in a huff. So uh. I, um, <laughs> liberalism is not a colored shirt or, or preaching without a tie on or, or, or preaching in a sports shirt. Liberalism is not thinking that um, there might be fresher, better ways to do things than... And, eight-day gospel meeting or a VBS that focuses. A lot of people count as liberal something that's different from the way I've always seen it or done it. I consider liberalism, and even in the days then when I was speaking against it, is moving away from the authority of Scripture. Now, a person can be very conservative and disagree about the meaning of Scripture. But you're a liberal if you say, well, I don't care what Scripture says. Um, th this is how I feel. Uh, this is what the culture is telling us. This is what, this is what psychology is telling us. Uh, 
about same-sex marriage, whatever. Well, my answer to that is, well, you don't determine truth by vote. And the fact that 51% of the people prefer doing it this way doesn't mean it's right. Um, psychology is not the discipline that, that determines morality. Uh, psychology studies human interactions with emotional states, human relationships. If you determine truth about a spiritual subject or a moral issue, uh, you have to go to a source of revelation, not with a capital R as in the mm. last book of the New Testament, but um, revelation. You have to go to something that has come from God because God alone is is pure in his nature and infinitely wise in his understanding. And if he says murder, adultery, uh, men and women having sex with the same sex, uh, divorce, other things are, are things to be avoided because they're outside his will, that doesn't change because, well, let's vote on it and see if people feel that way. No, no, no. Um, liberalism says there is no necessity of living under the authority of Scripture, living within the narrative of Scripture in our time. I'm still adamantly opposed to liberalism. i adamantly opposed to physicalism and materialism. Um, I believe that we are the creatures of God made in his image and likeness, meant to bear that image to one another, and that God has communicated to us, quote Hebrews 1 here, across the centuries, all kinds of prophets at different times, different circumstances, but, but now has spoken to us most definitively um, by coming in the flesh in the person of Jesus. And so all of this Jewish scripture, all of this Old Testament material is still part of my Bible. And um, I'm as biblically conservative, I think, as you can afford to be without being squeaky. But mm. I, I'm not I'm not tradition conservative. Right. I don't think any one tradition, any one local church, any one school, any one paper, certainly not me. I don't think there's any one source other than Scripture that has the definitive last word. And this is a fair, this is a small library of books. It's not just one book. It's not surprising to me that there are difficult passages in here. It's not surprising to me that intelligent people don't always come down exactly at the same point on how to apply some of these in challenging circumstances. But I want to be a Christ confessor and a Christ follower and a, a, a liberal attitude that says we don't need this. I still, and, and Doug is the same way, and Doug's a friend, I still want to be a loud voice against that. Well, what's interesting is, you know, when you start reading the materials, you know that a lot of people, when they hear the word liberalism, they want to come down on the piano and they want to come down on women preachers. But the way that you said what you just said is actually the way that Roy Deaver defined liberalism when he wrote the preface to John Waddy's book on liberalism. So anybody who hears this and they say, well, I don't really like the way Ribble just said all that. Well, they're not going to like the way Roy Deaver said it either. <laughs> and so those are 1970 documents. Uh, another point about some of your background that people won't know, the education, the, and even as you said, uh, you said I would still probably own that label from Doug being one of the loudest against liberalism. Oh, yeah. And the other part of it is when I go back and I read Firm Foundations and I, I just like looking at the personalities, the histories, the papers. So in the time frame that you were at teaching at Freed Hardeman, 75 to 79, you had three public debates then, uh, one against sprinkling, immersion in sprinkling, one on oral tradition in the Bible. I believe that one was in Iowa with a man named Kirk. And then Dunning was instrumental. I'm Kirk? I'll, your memory may be better than mine. I don't remember okay. that. Okay. Uh, well, that's what the topic was. Okay. Inspiration of the Bible versus oral tradition. And then Dunning was instrumental music. Yeah. And these, some of these were held in Harding Academy, Academy Auditorium. Yeah, the the one uh, the one on on baptism, uh, a really sort of sweet spirited Presbyterian guy. He and I did a debate discussion on um, baptism, infant baptism, sprinkling versus immersion. Um, as I recall, um, eight people were <laughs> baptized huh. in that week, ten days following that, and. One of the guys, young man, um, he was probably still in high school at the point, may have been in college, 
uh, became a missionary, uh, a purchase of Christ, uh, married a girl from here in Nashville. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think debates, that they're very much out of style these days. Um, philosophers still do debates. Maybe that's one reason I was attracted to, to philosophy. But, but after we debate, we'll go to dinner together and, mm -hmm. and, and treat each other respectfully. Um, I, I, I think the exchange of ideas is healthy. And I don't mind being disagreed with. If I'm wrong, I'm the first person that wants to know it. Um, as a philosopher, uh, Socrates is sort of our paradigm philosopher. Um, Socrates had really strong convictions about things, but he was always doing what he called an elenchus. Uh, I think we'd call it a cross-examination. Well, why do you think differently? And, well, explain that. Well, and he'd push back. And I think the reason Socrates did it, the reason he's sort of the paradigm that we point to in philosophy, he had strong convictions, but he never believed that he had the last word on it or that there wasn't more, perhaps, to be learned. Um, so... Um, that's very much how I feel about it. Um, I, I am not wed to any view that I hold today if somebody can bring me information that I haven't seen. I've got to say, whoa, um, don't bother me with the new information. I've got my mind made up on that. That's, no, no, no. Um, you have something I haven't thought about. That's a question that I don't think I've ever heard. I've got to think about that one. Um, I may need to go read another book. I may need to do some more work on background to the Gospel of Matthew or what's going on in the book of Acts or in First Peter. Um, so I'm doing the best I can on any given day, but I don't think I've got it all in my box yet. Well, I think that there's some aspect of that, too. I mean, you guys, when you were having that debate in Harding Auditorium, you all were packing the house, so... If you started doing a good job, then I can imagine you would probably start getting fewer debate opportunities. Uh. Well, uh, the, the, the debates that I've done, the most recent ones, have been on the existence of God uh, at um, University of Birmingham, um, um, UAB several years ago at Vanderbilt. Did one in, um, I guess it was Iowa State uh, about the resurrection and the authority of Scripture. Um, the, the, the last few debates I did were, were not about e even baptism or instrumental music. They were, they were about the existence of God. I, I wish everybody's main concern was a cappella versus instrumental music, because I guess that would mean, well, they certainly believe in God, they believe in Jesus, they want to be a part <laughs> of the church, and they want to follow him faithfully. And so we, we, would, we would want to parse out well, what, what is the best way to do worship, uh, what's the best way to do communion? What's the best way to do prayer? I, I wish we were all right there. But the world I live in, out here, the people who are making the loudest noise and are having the most influence, they don't believe in God. They are antagonistic. That It's not that they don't believe in Jesus. They're antagonistic to Jesus. They are immoral. And they are leading my grandchildren and... I've got a great grandchild now. I've got another one on the way. They're, they're leading my grandchildren and will be leading my great grandchildren to a lifestyle of, of, of normalizing same sex marriage, um, substance abuse, um, premarital sex. I, 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 I want to talk, I don't want to ignore the folks who are close in. But anybody who's that close, they know Jesus, and Jesus is going to work that out with them. I'm, I'm working harder to try to talk to the people around the edges to say, God exists and that matters. Because there's a God, there's a right and wrong. And, and it's determined not by vote, but by his character. If it agrees with who he is, it's right. If it goes against the grain of his holiness, it's wrong. And that's why lying and divorce and premarital sex and homosexuality, that's why these things, it's, it's not just me being a bad guy trying to get in your face because you have a taste for something different. No, I believe we're accountable to God. And the accountability lies especially to the authority of Scripture that, that God has given to us. Uh, it's not that I'm disinterested in the close-in issues of church, but Anybody that's this close, God's got them close enough. He's, he's working with them. It's the folks out here who, who despise God. 
that I want I want to talk to them to say, do you despise God or do you despise church people? Um, are, are, are you really an unbeliever in Jesus or are you an unbeliever in some of us who say we are Jesus representatives because we've mistreated you, we've been rude to you, we have, we've been unkind to you, forgive us. Um, I told you the book that I've done on same-sex marriage. I apologize in the beginning of that book for attitudes that I've had at times in the past. Preachers got no business telling queer jokes from the pulpit, uh, mocking um, teenagers who are wrestling with gender dysphoria or whatever the psychological name that's put on the problems that are that are making them wonder maybe this is okay for me or I should that that's like walking into a room and somebody you disagree with you see them and you say your mama wears army boots and her feet stink well that's a good way to start a conversation um, you'll close the door before you start the conversation um, I'm I'm not going to tell those jokes anymore I, I Know, years ago, it was, it was cool. In high school, we used to say, you know, this is what we'd do if one of them ever showed up over here. Looking back, we probably had a couple in our class uh, who were, we used the word back then, sissy or effeminate. I wish I'd treated them differently. And instead of some of us mocking them like we did, uh, they never came to church. They never came to hear me preach, I might add. Um, it, it, being kind to people is not compromising. And loving an alcoholic or loving a drug addict, um, getting out of your car and going and eating with a homeless person who's begging on the side of the street, I think some of that would make us look more like Jesus than having some of the church fights that historically we've spilt so much blood and ink on. Well, I think that the church, as you said, the church fights with blood and ink that's a lot of what I have been looking at, and the thing that I see is how quickly people that we counted, like I'm saying, all of this background on you, as I read all the literature, just got tossed out the window. And, you know, we come together, we have these talks, and someone says, well, Rubel's starting to give us some different ideas than he was giving us in 1977, and it's like... Oh, I hope so. I wasn't talking enough about people who are poor. I wasn't talking enough about people who are minorities, black or Hispanic. Yeah, I, 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 wish, I wish I could get some new ideas into the minds of people. Right. Um, not about God, not about the authority of Scripture, not about Jesus. Without um, being cast out is how I meant that. Yeah. Because once you stop towing the line, yeah. it was all of those. Well, the, the institutional line um, is, is a dangerous line for anybody in whatever setting. Um, I... I, I hate that there's anybody who um, wouldn't hear the truth because I'm the one who voiced it, uh, and uh, I would would like to be uh, gracious enough and forgiving enough to anybody who's had problems with me in the past to say, I'll buy you lunch. We can sit down and talk. I remember a conversation that I had with a preacher Church of Christ preacher in this town. Um, and it was back in some of those days when I was being written up. He preached a couple of sermons, and a guy from our church had visited there one day. His family went there. And um, he just said some awful things about me. And the guy came back and reported. I said, really? I wonder if he'd have lunch with me. He said, well, I know him. I'll set it up. I said, oh, if you will, I'll pay. So we had lunch. Um, a few pleasantries, and we order, and we sit. And I said, Jimmy told me that he was there when you said some things. Could we talk about those things? And could, could you ask me face to face what you believe about this or, that, or what I believe about it? We got through eating, and... Um, Here's what it boiled down to. I said, okay, let me make sure I understand you. You're saying that unless a person, and this is as close to a verbatim quote as I could give you, 
unless a person learns about Jesus and, quote, is then baptized in a Church of Christ baptistry, in a Church of Christ building by a Church of Christ preacher, you would not consider him to be Christian. He said, absolutely. I said, I, I can't get my head around that. I still can't. That's the ultimate, I guess, of an institutional line. That if it's not in our, on our property, in, in our baptistry, <laughs> at our hands, um, that's, you know, if, if we want to chide Roman Catholics for thinking there's no salvation outside the one true church, which they define as their church, we're that version of it, but minuscule times, smaller. Um, I'd, I'd rather start here on the platform of Scripture with a Catholic, a Protestant, an atheist, somebody who's an alcoholic, somebody who's gay. I'd rather start just on, on the platform of Scripture to say, can we talk about Jesus? Uh, do you know who he is? Um, you ever considered the claims that he makes in Scripture on, on your life and the difference that would make? Um, but if it's that institutional, now, I, I, I'll never be able to fit that mold. Right. And you, that story, I don't know what the time frame of that would have been, but you had it in the 60s and you get it all over again in the 80s. So one of the things that I wanted to, I had mentioned this before, was a lot of times when young guys are going through what you have described, whether it's in 68, I'm studying the Bible, this is what I see, this is what I need to preach. I think a lot of young men think that it's very, very particular to them, and they're trying to figure out why Why does everyone else seem to be having such a cakewalk, and I'm over here struggling. And mm -hmm. so you consistently keep moving, and in 82, 1982, you did a series of sermons called Undenominational Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so can you tell us, I know you did one particular on Mark 9. How did you feel about that one going into it? <laughs> um, when my wife and I moved to Nashville, uh, I was here to do graduate work. And the first year, maybe first year and a half that I was here, I'll be honest, I, I had very limited responsibility at the church. Um, and uh, it was just to preach Sunday morning and night and teach a Wednesday night class. That was it. No office hours, nothing. They knew I was a full-time student. And so I dipped back into old sermons. You know, I cherry picked, you know, the, the, the best sermons that I thought I could. I'd gotten to the point that I realized, hmm, I preached far too topically. Um, not all those were bad sermons, but um, I'm just going to start preaching through the text of the Bible. And so I started preaching through the Gospel of Mark, a short gospel. I wound up, Caleb, preaching 64 sermons. A short gospel. In that series. Yeah, a short <laughs> gospel. And, and, and what I would do, I mean, I'd, I'd start, and if in 30, 35 minutes, okay, 40, 45 minutes, uh, 30, 35 minutes, if I got five verses done, or if I got two chapters done, that, that's what I did. It was very expository. Well, I don't think I got over three to five verses most any time to get 64 sermons out of 16 chapters. Well, I got to Mark 9. And there's the story of the, the disciples telling Jesus that they'd run into this guy and he was casting out demons. And they put a stop to that because he wasn't one of us. And Jesus said, why, 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 did, you, why did you tell him to stop? He said, well... He wasn't one of us. Yeah. I, I don't know how he had the power to cast out demons. I don't know if Jesus and he had had some conversations or he was sort of a 13th apostle that didn't, mm. didn't make this. I don't know. But Jesus said, don't stop him. No one can do a miracle in my name and then in the next moment say anything bad about me. If you're not against us, you're for us. Give a cup of water in my name you're not going to lose your reward. We're leaving home uh, Sunday morning and I'm going to preach that text. And I turned to my wife and I said, um, this may be our last Sunday at, at Ashwood. She said, 
Why? What do you mean? I said, well, I'm just preaching through Mark, and I've come to a text today that I have never preached before. I have never heard it preached before. And I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say about it. She said, well, what is it? I told her. I said, let's go, and we did. So I, I preached the sermon. And I said, church, when we talk about how do we apply this scripture in our setting, it seems to me obvious that we have been inclined to say, if you're not one of us, you can't be a Jesus follower. Can that possibly be true? Uh, do we really believe God's heart is as small as, as our fellowship of people in of the fellow churches of Christ? Uh, do we not think that there's a, an honest woman, a, a, an inquiring young person who can read the gospel and come to understand and believe? I, I said, I made some obvious applications. I said, we, we've been, I'll probably use the term, we've been institutional, mm -hmm. we've been insular, we, we've been judgmental of other people. Our task is to be faithful in our own pursuit of Christ and to encourage others in theirs. And... Um, I sort of raced myself. What would follow? I thought it might be sort of like that church in Mississippi mm -hmm. preaching on racism. It wasn't at all. The first person who got to me after the service closed, we'd had a closing song or two and a dismissal prayer, was a fellow who was in his 80s. He was a, he was a retired executive for the old life and casualty insurance company. I later preached his funeral came up to me, had a gravelly sort of voice, strong voice, took my hand, shook it. He said, Rupert, I'm glad to finally hear somebody say from the pulpit what I believed for 40 years. And I said, thank you. I, I, I didn't know how today's sermon. He said, oh, I said, I, I, you know, how dare we be as arrogant as we've sometimes been with people. And then a little lady came up to not a little lady. She was probably in her 50s. Not, this guy was, was a little old guy in his 80s. Right. But she was probably in her 50s, maybe. And she came up to me sort of tearfully, not, not immediately after him, but she sort of hung around before she left. She lived close to the building and would walk. She said, thank you for what you said today. I said, my, my son's not a member of the Church of Christ anymore. I said, he loves Jesus. And he said, I, I, I've, I've believed for the last few years. That, that, that there are people outside our fellowship who not part of our church is the way she put it who still love Jesus and we're trying to please him thank you and and that sermon then got preached I was asked to uh, deliver it at a, at a preacher uh, forum down at Centerville Tennessee and and that sermon became the springboard to four Wednesday night classes um, that became the book, I Just Want to Be a Christian. Um, but that yeah, is, that, that's, that's the history of the, of the book being written. In 83, from what I have read, is uh, that is when the lid blew off. You did Centerville, and I, I don't know if it was taped, but transcripts yeah, ran out. Yeah. And the thing about that, and one other point about people and not recognizing the appreciation they ought to have for Rubel Shelley, and basically the background work that you have done, if it weren't for this book, they wouldn't have Thomas Horne's book. Mm -hmm. And they love that book. The why did, How's it go? The Bible only makes Christians only and the only Christians. <laughs> that was the response to this. And Well, let me tell you about that Centerville speech. When I made the speech at Centerville, there were some people and some good questions, helpful questions, but a couple of them were sort of sharp and pointed that, you know, we are the only Christian type thing. Well, at the back of the room, there was an, I'd say at the time, an elderly man, probably about the age I am now. His name was J.M. Powell. He was a staff writer for the Gospel Advocate. Uh, he did lectures all around Middle Tennessee uh, on restoration history. Wrote, wrote a book that Gospel Advocate, I think, published on, on restoration movement. He stood up and, and raised his hand. And um, uh, whoever the moderator was um, said, uh, Brother Powell wants to say something. Brother, pa Brother Powell, come up to the microphone so we can hear you. And I thought, hmm, I don't, I don't really know him. Um, 
knew, knew who he was, J.M. Powell. Hmm. I wonder what he's going to have to say. You know, this this could be bad. Because yeah. <laughs> I know some of these people have been sort of pot-shotting and, and said, okay, we may have different views. So he came up, stood behind the podium, and he said, brothers, some of you are upset at what this, and he called me a young man. Maybe that's why I remember. Yes. What this young man has said to us today. He said, why? He said, this is what the American Restoration Movement has been about historically. And he said, the, the, we have never historically claimed to be the only Christians. And he quoted a couple of Restoration people. He said, what this young man has said today is what we be, need to be saying. Well, it sort of diffused the tension in the room. There were a few more questions, then we dismissed. I found out probably more than 10 years later through his daughter, Patsy Mitchell. And Brother Powell had, and it may have been more than 10, Brother Powell was dead when she told me this. And Patsy said, we won't. Dad told me about that day in, in, in Centerville and the speech he made and that he had some things to say. And I said, yeah, and Patsy, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I never communicated to him as well as I should how much I appreciated his sort of having my back that day. He teared up a little bit. She said, I don't know if you know the price my dad paid for doing that. Probably didn't even respond. I, I, I it, frankly, I guess I was so self-absorbed. I hadn't thought about it. somebody of his stature paying a price for it. I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "You know, he gave these lectures and he'd teach maybe four week, uh, four Wednesday night classes on restoration history and so on." I said, "Yeah." He said, "After that day at Center, that was over." said some that he already had scheduled. All were canceled. He said he, he essentially was, um, excuse me, use the term blackballed. That's the word I'd use. That's what I would think. He was essentially blackballed yeah. because he said that what you had said was biblical and that it was part of our history. Um, I wish I'd known that. He was still alive. I, w I wish I'd known it to thank him in ways beyond what I did for, for that day. Well, but that was Jay and Powell. That that story, you, I, I did not know that he did that. And I think that people would not want me to know. It's like I'm doing my research and reading all of these stories. So this is something that I would like to really insert here. I, I don't really think that you like to talk about yourself. And I don't... <laughs> No, I, I don't. You, I'm, I, these, these things that I'm trying to build about, this is what I want to say, Rubel. In the 70s, you were the superstar. And I, I heard you a moment ago say that you weren't trying to be. The way that anybody reads the story, that they get the papers out, you were the superstar. And when you said blackball, I want young guys to know and be ready for it. If they try to climb this ladder, if that's what they're shooting for, it can be ripped out from underneath them mm -hmm. so quickly. And I think, Rubel, that that's what they did to you. Well, um, it, it's not about me. But and you're a it's person. It's not about you and, and uh, some young preacher who hears this and who, on whatever topic, has come to a conclusion that, but if I say that, I'll be fired. Judiciously, lovingly, kindly, and in the right place. Don't go spoiling for a fight. But mm -hmm. if, if you're asked your conviction about it, speak your conviction. Um, live with integrity, uh, and and the worst thing in the world is not to lose a job. The worst thing in the world is to lose your integrity. I don't know that integrity was a word my dad used a lot, but if anybody were and people have asked me describe your dad and his influence on you, I'd say he was he was a man of of utmost integrity. He was. My dad read that book. It's dedicated um, to your father. With me in the last. Two, three weeks of his life, he, he was dying when that book was in, uh, just became ill very suddenly and was sick for only three and a half weeks. We went through that book. And once we'd 
gone through it. I, it was in its second draft, I think. I said, well, Dad, what do you think of that material? He said, when I was growing up, that's what I was taught. And I've always wondered why we quit saying it. Well, now, he went to Freed Hardeman in 1924 to 1926, and Freed and Hardeman were both teaching there at the time. And if you read the Hardeman Tabernacle Sermons from the 20s, and I'm, there was one in 26, 27, whatever, Hardeman says in, that, in, in the Tabernacle Sermon of, of the 20s, I've never claimed that the people with whom I have communion on the first day of the week are the only Christians. In the Hardeman Tabernacle Sermons in the 1950s volume, that changes. And he said, I... That's what I was taught. And he said, if you publish that, you're going to lose friends. I said, maybe, but I said, I, I've come to believe this is true. Um, his last request to me was, well, try to get it published. And so that's why it's dedicated to him. Uh, my dad was a good man, a godly man, elder, little church in Middleton, Tennessee, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. he, he and my mother... God's best salt of the earth. My mother's the best Bible teacher I've ever had, and that includes my undergraduate and graduate professors with PhDs. Um, she's the best Bible teacher I ever had, and my dad's the best example of Christian manhood I'll ever see. Um, I tell people, if I could be half the man my dad was, I'd be twice the man I am, and, and that's not just rhetoric. That's, that's the truth. He was a godly good man. Why, and that's what I want to encourage with this is, as you said, to act with integrity and follow their convictions. Yeah. I think a lot of younger guys are, they're surprised when they do it that they start getting all that pushback. And as you, I, in this book, you have more quotations than just N.B. Hardeman. Uh, you have very heavy quotes from Gus Nichols and Guy yeah. Woods. There's plenty in there. So with... Let the, me give you another Gus Nichols quote. Okay. Gus Nichols was introduced one time as a model Christian and a model gospel preacher. And his response was, well, I appreciate that kind introduction from Brother So-and-so. He said that I was a model Christian and a model preacher. I accept that. Paused then and he said, if you'll look up the word model in the dictionary, you'll find that it means a small scale replica of the real thing. <laughs> A model car, a model airplane. He said, I'm a small scale replica. I'm, I want to be more like that. I like that. I like that too. I'm glad that all these quotes have been compiled. I think, and <laughs> it's, it's hard to go and find all the quotes. You know, that's. <laughs> well, uh, I, I owe one of my elders at Ashwood a, a debt of gratitude. It's, it's said in the book. Uh, Robert Hooper was uh, a history teacher at Lipscomb at the time, long since retired now. But when I began to preach that material, uh, he came in one day with a sheaf of papers, handed it to me, he said, if you think you're discovering new things, I, I study history. Let, let, let me give you some things to read. And so I'm reading H. Leo Bowles and Gus Nichols and, and the various other people that, that I knew their names and respected them. Um, and uh, G.C. Brewer. And um, he said, this is, this is our heritage. And I'm, I'm glad you're stumbling into it. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, read his book called is it Not a Distinct People or A yeah, Distinct uh, People. A Distinct People, yeah. yeah. And I, uh, I got, it's towards the end. I thought you could have had a bigger section in there, but you are in that book too. Mm. And you'll be in a number of these books, and that's why I'm <laughs> saying the the villainization versus the appreciation that ought to be there. That's what I'm wanting to get out. And just to, for them to check out the book, really honestly, for them to just give it a read. If they could find one. I mean, that book's been out of print for a long well, time. Well, <laughs> that's what I was going <laughs> to... Maybe gonna, I need to do a 40-year... I was going to ask you, uh, <laughs> you ought to do that. One more uh, note on that in 83, and that's why I brought this copy of Mission with me. Uh, when you, acting with integrity, as you said it, gospel advocate, firm foundation, spiritual sword, mission, 
and Restoration Review, you were in all of those in 1983. And even had a had your book reviewed by D.A. Carson. Did you know that he did that? I did. I don't think I've read it. Okay. Um, and, and, and let me explain that. I don't do what I do and decide whether it was worth doing based on what somebody thinks of it. I'm doing the best I can do right. to think through a complex question or a question that has fascinated me. But no, I, I honestly, I, I knew that Carson had written some sort of review. I didn't know it was yeah. a lengthy one, but I, I don't think I've read it. Out of that list that I just gave, Gospel Advocate, Firm Foundation, Spiritual Sword, Mission, Restoration Review, and D.A. Carson, who do you think is the only one who spoke kindly of you? I, I wouldn't want to guess. <laughs> Leroy Garrett, Restoration mm -hmm. Review. Uh, Mission gave you a whole edition, 1985. I didn't know that. This is Christians only, not the only Christians. There's a book review for your book and Thomas Warren's book, and uh, they said you didn't go far enough. Mm. And that's what D.A. Carson said, too. But I thought it was interesting. Mm. Uh, Leroy Garrett. I, I didn't know that. Oh, this yes. Uh, this is, And I thought it was funny that they did it in February, yeah. which... And, <laughs> and understand, I mean, I'm not naive. I read, but I don't read about me. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand that. Uh, and I hope that you understand what I'm trying to accomplish here. It, I think it's ridiculous for you to not get the appreciation. You're, and you can, I get it. You say, I'm not hunting for it. It is ridiculous for you to write this book, have the quotations, stir people's minds, and these folk try to bury you. I do, I want to ask one of your opinion. I'd like to get to the 84 open forum if you have time for it. I read most of the spiritual swords from that time frame. And I know a lot of the people who are writing in that time frame, 83, 84, 85. And there's some rough dudes. Nobody was using your name. And I read that. They are certainly answering your articles. And I thought, do you think that Thomas Warren, and I'm saying this in a good way, kind-hearted, do you think him as editor was asking them not to? Do you think he shielded you? You know, I don't know. Uh, that, that would not be inconsistent with his character. Brother Warren was not. A mean spirited person. Uh, I worked with him uh, in a debate that he had with an atheist, and one of the things that he went out of his way to do was to be respectful and kind. So uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if somebody had my name in there. He may have just, mm. I, can, I can imagine him saying, Someone has said, yeah. no, so that it wouldn't be. Um, he didn't use your name. Uh, none of the writers were using your name. They were absolutely answering some of your... In 83, uh, before Rule Lemons left, you still had articles in Firm Foundation. Right. And they were, they were certainly... And Brother Lemons, not well, but he, he, he was always very friendly toward me. They were certainly answering. So, I, just a few more if you, if you don't mind. The way that I said that a moment ago, that... If I can say that again, the, the, the level that you were at in the 70s, the amount of work you had accomplished, I was able to, I have heard the 84 open forum, but I read it before I listened to it. And multiple people were able to talk from the mic. Alan Hires gave you about 10 minutes. At that point in time, you were 39. You had your PhD. You had all of those things that you had done in the past underneath your belt. Alan Hires had known you since you were in high school. Is that correct? He held a meeting or two in the little church. Um, yes. I had known him since I was in high school. Okay. He's, at that time, I believe, you know, he would have been a federal judge by then. Probably. Garland Elkins is in the room. He worked at Get Well. He took over Spiritual Sword, mm -hmm. or worked with Spiritual Sword at some point. Not to over-embellish, but if you pick a historical marker, I'm saying when you went into that room and you take a 10-minute microphone on the floor with so many people in the room against you, I read that and I told my wife, I said, this is like the diet of worms. 
Rubel Shelley getting called to the microphone, and you wanted to. I mean, you wanted to have a moment. But that's just how I felt when I read it. It's a room of people who have, two years ago, super appreciated this 38, 39-year-old man. And the way that you said that in the audio was you said, I have been in this room, and I have watched men lay their guts bare and thought it was magnificent. And I feel like they turned around and did it right back to you. And yeah, I, I watched them do that to W.D. West. I watched them do that to Langdon Saunders and probably other people. Lynn Anderson watched Lynn. Brother Baxter watched him be crucified in that form years ago. And just that's those are the things that, as you said a moment ago, it is not about you and it's not about me and it's not about these young men, but I'm seeing a lot of young men get mistreated. And when I say mistreated, that's one word that does not encapsulate their kids have to be ripped out of school. Their wives have to, if they've made friends, they're going to leave their friends, and their friends probably don't want to be their friends anymore. And they're going to have to move to a whole other state, and they're going to think, we'll probably have to do this two years from now. And I think that what you were doing in that time frame, I think that in the 80s you were fighting for those young guys mm -hmm. that were going to have that done to them. Well, my children. Um paid a much higher price than I realized at the time. Um, some of the things that were said to them um, in the school, uh, in the Christian school they were attending, um, by teachers that embarrassed them in, in front of their peers. Um, that's uncivil. Forget unchristian. That's, that's just not civil. I learned about most of that 12, 15 years after it happened. They were protecting me, I suppose. Mm. I hate that other people pay the price. Um, the, I had heard that the day before at, at, for that Frida Hardeman episode that some things had been said about me that were just scurrilous, just false. So um, I decided to drive down and be in the audience the next day. Curious to see if they would say it, quote, to my face, or if I could respond to it. Um, I'd never gone back and listened to the tape. I've never read the transcript of it. Um, it was just an off-the-cuff response to what was going on that day. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for the two or three years I had as a student there. And I'm grateful that I began to learn Greek there under William Woodson. Grateful. I, I never had a class under Brother Warren at uh, Freed Hardeman. He came just as I was leaving. Um, but I studied under him at the graduate school. H.A. Uh, Dixon was present. Really grateful for the influence he had. I had some really wonderful experiences there. Um, and we'll always be grateful for them. But that week um, used to represent a really bad part of that institution's life. It, it would be a matter of we're, we're going to set the issues straight and set the people straight. So um, I had seen some of that happen in the past, and I guess I thought that was good. And when it, when the wheel came around, I guess I, guess I got what I asked for. Well, that the way that you said it, uh, the way that you said it while you were there, you said, "I've participated in this in the past," and you said, "I deserve it." You had a original uh, preface to your book. I just want to be a Christian, and that's what you said there. You said, "I've sat in their meetings. I know how they plan. I know how they hurl their theological missiles." And you said it. It came back. Can I tell you one thing that's funny about the audio? Is of all the things that one of the some of the things that you said in there. Do you think you were purposely misunderstood? Um, I, I haven't always thought I got a fair hearing oh, from from yeah. from people. <laughs> Your the points you were making were not ambiguous by any means. And we just, if you read it, if you listen to it, we're just going in circles, going in circles. And you're saying things like, I don't want to have to come in a room and salute the party flag. 
I knew exactly what that meant. Everyone knew what that meant. Well, at some point, the moment when you said, I've sat in this room and I've seen men have their guts laid bare, you got a big round of applause. And when that happened, Alan Hires said, well, let's not do that. He said, I think when we do something like that is when we really start dividing ourselves up. Well, you were the only one who got applause in that discussion. And then y'all had a little bit of back and forth that wasn't too uh, sectioned off, and some people got it kind of talked over. And uh, Alan Hires, he said, well, this ain't a fireside chat. And you said yesterday it was a roasting. And when you said that, the room roared with laughter. And I think, Rubel, that that's basically, as I have read your books, read the stories, and you go in that room, you get your applause, you, and you make the people laugh. I've seen other things that you do, and you're funny. I think that the party just, they looked at you and they said, we do what we have to do. You may not accept that. Me, as a 29-year-old, like I said, decade in brotherhood politics, I look backwards and I... Uh, whether they agree with you or not, and there's still things that I don't all the way agree with you on, and I'm saying, oh, I hope not. I don't, I don't like that viciousness. Yeah. Well, th there's no place for that in the body of Christ. Um, the the person that I, frankly, will bend over backward to be kindest to is the person probably that I have the greatest disagreement with because I can't talk to them if I can't be respectful. Uh, at least I can't talk to them so that they would hear. And the, the, the very idea that the way for me to lead someone to Christ is to corner them and to trap them and to use a debater trick to, to trip them up. No, uh, that's, that's human wisdom, and, and that's not being led by the Spirit of Christ. And you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good at handling controversy. I, I can be far too defensive. But increasingly, um, I, I just try not to respond. The, the determination I made back when I wrote that book was, and this was a conversation I had with Batsleberry Baxter. He said, my best advice is just don't respond to your critics. And he said, I, I used to try to respond to mine. He said, I think for the same reason you've tried at times. But if they just, if, if I could speak clearly, if, if I could say it a different way, maybe they'd understand. He said, he said, I, um, I, I think you'd be better served just to let what you say stand on its own merit. Because every explanation you try to give of why you said it the way you did will generate another round of response and attack. He said, just let it stand for what it is. It was good advice, and I, for the most part, I think I've listened to that. I've, I've probably tried to respond sometimes when I shouldn't have. Well, well, I'm going to have had so much of your time, I just I have a few more things, and I said that a moment ago. I just want to quickly point these out. For your credit, uh, all of that that was done, 84, 85, uh, do you happen to know, and I just can't imagine, in 1986 what the Memphis School of Preaching Lectures did? I wasn't there. They gave praise to the restorers, Alexander Campbell, which essentially is the argumentation is the same. Christian mm -hmm. Baptist volume number one will be the same argumentation here. In 87, you wrote this small book, A Case for Acapella, Music as Worship Today, and I'm saying, from what I can see, it got you no credit. They honored J.W. McGarvey at the Memphis School of Preaching Lectures. J.W. McGarvey would agree with that book, right? And just... It's unbelievable that that's the games that folk are playing. And so you went through all of it and just kept pushing. And one of the last ones was in uh, 1990. You wrote that article about, I wouldn't be able to pronounce it correctly, but it translates to work makes free. Oh, our bikes about to try. Right. Yeah. The Nazi slogan over all the concentration camps. I think anybody who sees this at this moment will, I think that they'll say this is a man who doesn't want to talk about himself, who doesn't really want to have the accolades of the past. I think that 1990 is what you were working towards. Work makes free. And I think it's an honest work of, on your part, of trying to help people see 
how squashed down you can be and not realize it. Well, the the Arbeit Mach Fry piece was an attempt to say nothing we do gives us status before God. It, it is of grace, entirely of grace. And um, I think at that point, our people weren't talking a lot about grace. Um, I, I used to use the line, yeah, grace was the blue-eyed blonde two counties over. Um, no, uh, grace is much more into the theology of most of our churches uh, these days. And if I help push that along a little bit, I'd really be grateful. I have a book in process um, on, on that that I hope to get finished within the next year or two. Now that I'm retired, I have more time to write. Yeah, I hope that you do. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, what I want to do, especially in that book, the subtitle is The Theology of Grace. The, t the working title is More Than a Fig Leaf. Um, it, it begins in Eden. Um, Adam and Eve thought they could cover the shame of their sin with fig leaves. God said, no, nothing humans can do is going to fix this. You're going to need full-length leather coats before you have to leave this garden. So God gave them clothing of skins. It, the, the only rescue is, is what God has done through Christ. And to speak of grace is, is the point of that book, and especially to tell the Old Testament stories more faithfully than they've been told. The story of Nadab and Abihu mm -hmm. is not a story of two well-intentioned young men who made a mistake in a moment of anxious hurry and God smote them. It's of two guys who are drunk as skunks, who are irreverent before God and they're struck down for it. Read the second half of the chapter. What happens is a law is now given on the day that a priest officiates that you can't touch alcohol. And Moses comes in and tells Aaron, you dress the other two boys up, get them up there to offer the sacrifice. And remember, this is a sacrifice that when it's offered, you take it down and you eat it with your family and you, you don't leave any of it, you don't let it burn. Chapter's not over. The sacrifice is burned to ashes. Moses comes into Aaron, I guess, assuming I'm not going to have any priests anymore. They didn't take it down. They didn't eat it. They let it burn to ash. Aaron turns to Moses and said, this is the RSV, Rubel Shallow version. Aaron turns to Moses. He said, they just buried their brothers. You think they could eat? And Moses says, oh, you're right. They committed a far graver offense against the letter of the law that they had just been reminded about by Moses. Dress them up, offer the sacrifice. Remember, you eat it, you don't burn. God shows much more grace, much more kindness, much more patience with us in our humanness than we are inclined to want to show each other. Um, I'd like to be a little more like God in that regard. Um, and, and tell those stories more faithfully. So in that book, I'm, I'm, I'm going through to show God didn't become a Christian in 30 AD. <laughs> th th this is not a bad God and a good God, a mean God and a loving God. The God of grace has been at work from Eden forward, um, help, trying to help us cover our shame by taking the initiative for our redemption. I believe that. So I want to get that book written. Well, I um, hope that you do. I. Uh... That was one of the things when we got done was I was going to, going to really encourage you. I hope you will write your own autobiography. I wish you would. And then I was no going to say, and I hope that you write uh, a book on the Old Testament. I think that in 92, that article that you wrote, Work Sets You Free, I think that's what got some more attention back on to you in 92 with, I would say, from Keith Mosier's perspective of wanting to participate in the Harding Graduate Preachers Forum. Hmm. Can you just can you tell us anything about that? How do you remember that that exchange? You had Romans four and James two, and he had Romans four and James two. Yeah, wasn't William Woodson <clears throat> part of that day too? And John Mark Hicks. And John Mark, yeah, yeah. John Mark and I tried basically to say, of course, there are all these things that <clears throat> we try to do. We try to teach others to do, but what we do. Uh, is holy if, if it's done in faith. 
but it doesn't save us. Um, the, the Bible is not against working, but it is against earning. And, and that's the point we tried to make that day. And that faith is obedient if it's true faith. But it's not the obedience that saves us. It's the work of Christ that saves us. And I, I don't... It, that was a frustrating day. Because we tried to be as clear, as straightforward as we could be. And um, I think we were heard by most of the people in the audience. But, but and, and I think Keith was a bit more willing to hear than William would. And I... And I hmm. He was, William had been such a good good friend to both John Mark and to me. We both would speak highly of him. But um, it was, that was frustrating. That was, that was very frustrating. Well, the audience was so big that the venue had to be moved. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 think, okay. I think I remember that. I'd, I'd forgotten, but they, yeah, they had to move it from their chapel at the, at the school. Well, I was, I had classes with Keith Mosier. And he never mentioned 92 preachers for him. Uh, he, he would be one of those people who never told the whole story. He would say things about you and, quote, liberalism. But the mm -hmm. reason he said, he said, I would never debate Rubel, he said, because I could not control my temper. And so he said that was his reasoning for never having that with you. But one before he, I don't, we never talked about having a debate that I recall. Oh, yeah. well, <laughs> maybe he meant an expansion of yeah. 92. Uh, one thing I would just like to add, if you will entertain a couple questions after this. Thank you for doing it this far. It's meant a lot to me. Here, really quick, the five questions. Have you read Milton Jones's book, Grace, the Heart of the Fire? No. In it, he basically, in a particular chapter... I know Milton. Um, he has a chapter where he says, essentially, that conservatives, he said, one person moves from one side of the aisle to the next. He said, a young man is swapping conservative problem, problems for liberal problems. He said, evangelistic congregations tend to be legalistic. He said, and more liberal congregations tend to lack devotion. Have you found that? That it's just a simple swapping no, no. of problems? No, I, 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 don't, I don't accept the categories. Uh, okay. I, don't, I don't equate conservative and grace as being opposites, like conservative and liberal. Um, you can't be conservative, biblically conservative, without being filled with grace, it seems to me. So I, I haven't read the book, so it's, it's not fair for me to try to analyze what okay. he's saying. And uh, there was another quote. Leroy Garrett said a similar thing, the congregation where he was in Texas. He said, we taught, he said, we got real serious about teaching grace in the auditorium. He said, a bunch of people never came back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can imagine that. I, I'm, I'm sure there are people who've heard me talk about mm -hmm. grace and who have understood that to mean, oh, all bets are off. Grace has never meant, okay, uh, I'm free to do what I want to do without regard to the will of God. That's not grace. Grace is to understand that no matter what we do, the effective power to salvation is what has already been done in Christ. And for me, that would not mean, therefore, all bets are off. I can lie, steal, cheat on my wife, abuse my kids, whatever, because it's all of grace. Is as obscene as saying, because I love my wife, I can treat her any way I want to treat her. Because I love my wife, I do things for her that I wouldn't do for anybody else in the world. And I think every day of some way to try to make her day better. Um, my understanding of the grace of God makes me want to do what a sense of duty could never, ever have driven me to do. Uh, and one thing would be to, to stay in a fellowship with people at that time since needed felt it needed to be a bit abusive to me. I, I don't do this for the... I, don't, I'm, I, I once made this statement, and, and apparently a, a point was made of it. I don't serve the Church of Christ. I serve Jesus Christ. And I, I, I don't mean that as a bitter statement. I don't mean that as a on my nose at Churches of Christ. I am, I'm a card-carrying Church of Christer uh, in, in, in terms of the institutional background of my life and family and my adult work. But I don't serve the Church of Christ. I don't serve a, a body of people. I serve Jesus Christ, and that's why I am a part of a church fellowship where I believe I have the freedom to think and to grow um, and, and to teach and to challenge. Uh, to admit I've been wrong, 
to say, I think this is more correct than what I used to think about that. What do you think? Test it. Um, I, I value this heritage uh, of ours, and especially the fact of, of just the freedom and the independence that local churches have and that individuals have within those churches. Um, is it a perfect um, fellowship of folks? Oh, no. And uh, there will never be one of those until the Lord is back and we're in the redeemed environment of the new heaven and the new earth. Boy, I look forward to that. Um, I'll have more repenting to do probably at that point than I've had to this point. But um, no, I'm, I'm not at all convinced that there, there's a healthier place for me to be than where I have been because we're a group of people that with all of our flaws and warts and all religious groups have flaws and warts, um, we, we're Christ confessors. And, and we, we do emphasize the study of Scripture. Um, sometimes we need to broaden our horizon about how to read some of them. Shouldn't be afraid of, of, of reading other books and studying languages. It, it, it opened up the New Testament for me to have to go to graduate school and read Plato and Aristotle in Greek. I mean, all of a sudden, you, you, you just read the New Testament, and, and it's, it's not a different book, but, but you, you, you open and you realize that in the, that language and that culture, what Jesus was up against in his part of the Greco-Roman world, and especially what Paul was against out in the Gentile world, trying to communicate this message. So um, we're we're flawed fellowship, but we're healthier than we used to be, and we're healthier than lots of fellowships are, just by virtue of um, not having at least a written creed that, that you have to sign on to. <laughs> right. Uh, Forty. Looking back 40 years, do you think that there was, has become any accuracy to what people were saying about your relation to Carl Ketcherside and Leroy Garrett? I know I, you said you don't like the labels. I, I, I never read the works of those men. I, I'm sure they did good work. Uh, I am not a historian. I, I have not read, I've not read a lot of Alexander Campbell's. Um, I've I read a lot of J.W. McGarvey uh, because he had written some commentaries. Um, I, I, I would just say about those two men, uh, I'm, I'm sure I, I need to show them deference and respect, but um, I, th they were never teachers of mine. Um, anything that I've read of them has been uh, snatches. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that some people said, well, you're following the trail of those people probably made me say, well, I'm not going to read what they wrote because I'm, I'm trying to think for myself. Right. And, if, and if, if they're plowing a row close to mine, I want to make sure I don't get into their row. I'm trying to plow my row. Well, like I said, he, uh, he was watching you. Uh, Leroy Garrett was watching you from afar, mm -hmm. and he gave a thumbs up. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think uh, one that I would add to that, though, did you ever read uh, James Bell's Shall We Splinter? All it. I, I, to the best of my recollection, I, I never met Carl Ketcherside. Uh, I, I met Leroy Garrett, I think, a couple of times um, in, in public settings and in, in where we were either speaking uh, at, a, at the same place or I think he visited, um, I think he visited Woodmont Hills a time or two. Okay. I was preaching there, maybe when he was in town. But I um, never studied with them, never studied under them. Um, uh, Brother Bales, uh, I met, um, um, I held two or three meetings. I uh, never had a class under him at uh, Harding. I, I attended Harding one year. Freed Hardeman was just a junior college when I was there. Uh, I didn't have a class under Dr. Bales. Uh, I held a couple of meetings, maybe three, at the college church, met him, um, but I, I didn't really know him, no, know the book. I, well, I, did, I did not read. It was uh, after he really put out his marriage and divorce mm -hmm. ideas, and really people came down on him. And he, yeah, he and Jimmy Allen both got flailed well, his, because of the views. His book was the idea. It was basically a prediction, and I would say all the people made their predictions about you, and they said, well, this is Leroy Giddens, this is Carl Kitterson. Well, when James Bales wrote Shall We Splinter, I would say 40 years later his prediction is true. Southern works, like the clubs, whether it's 
gospel advocate firm foundation contending for the faith and Florida groups like that, they all have all divided from each other, mm -hmm. just like James Bell said they would, yeah. and over various topics. Last question. Uh, 40 years later, you use the word uh, bureaucratic organization. Some people have read the book and they said, well, Rubel just left one bureaucratic organization, went to another. They referenced Fried Hardeman to Rochester College. Do you, <laughs> do you look back and say, maybe I wish I had a third route that didn't involve a school, just an independent disciple-making entity? Yeah. I mean, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I, I've been a student and a teacher all of my life, and the way you do student and teaching is in schools. Ever expected Fried Hardeman to do my thinking for me? I mean, they, they were formative in my thinking, and I've changed my mind on some things and been reinforced in others. But I mean, I also went to Harding. Um, I also went to Harding Graduate School. I taught at Abilene, um, adjunct. Taught at Pepperdine, adjunct. Taught at Kentucky Christian College, adjunct. Taught at Rochester. So, I mean, it, no, I mean, I just, I don't know what to make of that question, to be honest, Caleb. I don't know where the quote came from. Um, I, I've never depended on schools to do my thinking. Schools are just places where you go to think, to be challenged to think, and as a teacher to challenge other people to think. And I've always said to my students, it is not my responsibility to do your thinking for you and to draw your conclusions. It is my responsibility to try to make you think and then your conclusion has to be your own. The student never got a better grade for agreeing with me uh, and a worse grade for disagreeing right. with me. My, my job always was think, be, be a critical thinker, and by critical I just mean weigh carefully. Um, think, weigh carefully, draw your own conclusion, and be willing to live with it. And that's what I've tried to do. Well. I think they'll get that out of the book if they'll read it 40 years later. Oh, I hope. I, I hope, hope so, too. Well, Yeah, I, I, I haven't, haven't read that book yeah. again in a long, long, long time. Yeah. It, Make I, a 40-year edition out of it. Well, at a 25-year mark, I was asked to review it at Lipscomb w with a, a group, and I do remember saying this about it. It was a legalist trying to think his way out of legalism who wrote that book. And, and I'm sure if I wrote it today, I'd, I'd write in a very different vein. But um, it was it, from the background uh, where I was trained, and it was a very legalistic, non-grace-oriented non view of the gospel. Uh, I was trying to think my way through legalism, and, and there's a lot of legalism, I'm sure, in the, in the tone and manner of argument even. But it, it was an important book for me to write, n not for you, but for me, because I was, that, that's how I think. Absolutely. And, and I, I've tried to explain this to people. I don't write because I think I know a lot that you need to know. I write things because that's how I think through a thing. And once I write it, if it helps somebody else think through, great. But I don't write it because I think I've got all the answers. I write it because I think there's some important questions that need to be wrestled with. Right. Well, my... Thanks for taking time. Oh, yes. Thank you for taking time with me. I think that a lot of your opponents uh, didn't actually read it. I think they just opposed <laughs> it. But if they would read it, I think they'd get something from it. Thank you for your time. It, Thank it, you, Your brother. time is very valuable, and this has meant a lot to me. Thank you. God bless. You too.